almost as big as they thought they were. <laughs> Aloha everyone, this is Brother Richie, minister from the Apostolic Faith Church, Seattle, Washington. So I recently visited the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium, located near Dublin, Ohio. The zoo is home to more than 11,000 animals, representing nearly 600 species from around the globe. The zoo is a regional attraction with global impact annually bringing in millions of dollars in privately raised funds to support conservation projects around the world. The world-famous Jack Hanna became the director of the Columbus Zoo in 1978 and remained director until 1993. Hanna's enthusiasm, along with his national television recognition, helped attract more visitors to the zoo than ever. He is viewed as being largely responsible for elevating the zoo's quality and reputation and making the Columbus Zoo a model facility. The Columbus Zoo is divided into major world regions, Australia, Asia, the Congo, Africa, North America, and the polar frontier. Each area showcasing particular animals from that region of the world. The North America section of the Columbus Zoo contains 15 large exhibits featuring recognizable animals like the wolf, North American River Otter, American Bison, Bald Eagle, and the Reindeer. Although a crowd favorite in this region was definitely the Cougars. The Polar Frontier featured animals native to colder climates. And the overwhelming stars of this region was definitely the Alaska Peninsula brown bear and of course the polar bears. The Asia Quest region showcased some more exotic animals native to the Asian continent. The standouts of this part of the zoo were definitely the Indian rhinoceros and elephant. The Australia region was located in the far west side of the zoo, lying along the east bank of the Skiota River. Here, everyone came to see the feeding koalas, the red kangaroos, and the eastern grey kangaroo. Near the Australia region was the Shores and Aquarium, Discovery Reef, and Manatee Coast sections of the facility. Now Manatee Coast, which opened in 1999, is the cornerstone of the region, supporting the endangered Florida manatees, fish, stingrays, and pelicans in a 192,000 gallon indoor habitat. This habitat is one of only two outside of Florida to keep manatees, making it an especially popular exhibit. The Congo expedition was probably the smallest area of the park, but it did have some very notable members, including the spotted leopard, the unusual looking okapi, and the very recognizable gorillas. And finally, the Heart of Africa region is located in the north and east of the zoo. The area encompasses 43 acres of land and features many African Plains animals. Featured animals which I was able to capture close up included the camels, the blue-necked ostrich, and the giraffes. Now the giraffe feeding activities were particularly popular, but it wasn't exactly the highlight of the entire exhibit. No, the highlight of the entire exhibit probably belonged to this guy, the African lion, Panthera leo. Lions are the most distinctive of the big cats. The coat is tawny color, which provides good camouflage. At about one year of age, males begin to develop their signature mane. When fully developed, it is a great ruff, 
which ranges in color from tawny yellow to dark brown as he grows older. Over the years, lions have been referred to as the king of the beasts, and the film industry has done much to promote that, with big screen hits like Narnia and, of course, Lion King. Now, why we give them this title is curious. Yes, a lion pride is able to take down even the largest of animals, which demonstrates a degree of dominance over all other species of the African plain. Or perhaps it is the signature mane, which looks both attractive and intimidating at the same time. It also makes the male lion look bigger than it really is. The mane helps the male lion stand out, looking important and distinguished and in charge like a noble. To challengers, it helps to make the male lion look great, strong, and fierce. After all, the male lions are responsible for protecting their territory and their pride or family of lions. But maybe the title king just comes down to the roar. Yes, that distinct, unmistakable, authoritative roar which a pride male uses to tell other lions that this is his territory and challengers need to back away. Supposedly that roar can be heard from three miles away, and this particular roar of authority cannot be mistaken for any other animal in the entire world. So again, I'm Brother Richie, minister from the Apostolic Faith Church in Seattle, Washington. And this is a broadcast of our Sunday afternoon devotional, Glad You Could Join Us. We'd like to invite you to our upcoming Wednesday evening Bible study at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And don't forget, we have our Sunday morning services currently running in our church at 7420 9th Avenue, Northeast Seattle, Washington. If you have any service inquiries, they can be sent to Apostolic Faith Church, Seattle at gmail.com. Also, subscribe to this YouTube channel for other sermons, Bible studies, and devotionals, which can also be found on the church website, afcseattle.org. Again, thank you for joining, and let's pray. Dear God and our Heavenly Father, as we come before you tonight and look into your inspired word, please guide us, and through the Spirit, give us wisdom, counsel, might, and power as we search the depths of the riches of of the wisdom and knowledge of God. And even more so, let us be encouraged and inspired by the unsearchable riches that we find in Christ Jesus, who is the Word, the truth, and the light. Tonight, let us know that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty, through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Amen. So, hello everybody. Let's uh, start off here with 1 Kings, the 10th chapter. And this is a biblical description of Solomon's throne. We don't speak about this very often, but um, for tonight, let's, uh, let's start off with Solomon's throne. And I want you to picture as much as possible in your imagination what this throne must have looked like. All right, so <clears throat> First Kings 10. Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with the best of gold. The throne had six steps and the top of the throne was round behind. And there were stays on either side on the place of the seat, and two lions stood beside the stays. And twelve lions stood there on the one side and on the other upon the six steps. There was not the like made in any kingdom. <clears throat> so, if you were to ascend the throne that was Solomon's throne, the Bible describes that you would have to climb six steps. And each step had a lion figure on each side. So you, when you ascended the throne of Solomon, you went past 12 lions. Six on each side. And then when you got to the throne, the Bible describes that the throne was made of ivory and it was covered with gold. The Bible describes it as the finest gold. And there you had two armrests on the throne. And it says, and there were two lions, one lion next to each armrest. And when you think about this throne, you, you think about, well, there were 12 lions and then there were lions on the top. Why in the world did Solomon use lions? 
Say, why, did, why didn't Solomon use a giraffe? Why didn't Solomon use a horse? Why didn't Solomon use a bear? Or even some, um, some sea creature. Why did Solomon actually use lions? And used a lot of lions, too. Well, it's because there is no other creature that depicts nobility, no other creation of God that depicts rule and authority better than the lion. As we had spoken of a little earlier. So you see, as you ascended the throne, it would have been impossible as you went from step to step to step. It would have been impossible for you not to recognize that you were climbing to finally reach a seat of authority. So authority for tonight. What is that really? Uh, what is authority and what, what, what isn't it? Most definitions, if you go look it up, um, pretty much say it's an attribute that gives one the right or the power to command. So just think about that a little bit. It is an attribute that gives one the right or the power to command. I think actually authority is, is much more difficult to pin down than just the simple definition. And you, and you can see that throughout the Bible. There's a very fascinating uh, story in, in the book of Luke, which I want you uh, to read here. It's in Luke, the seventh chapter, beginning at verse two. And it may help us to understand the meaning of authority and what it is as well as what it's not. So we start off here. This is a story about the centurion. And the Bible says, a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews. So here you have a centurion. This is a strange mix, actually. You have a centurion, and he sent unto Jesus the elders of the Jews. Now, what was a centurion de uh, doing dealing with the Jews? Um, nevertheless, uh, we find out later, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. All right. So why would the Jews go and beseech Jesus and ask him to come and heal the centurion servant? And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he, the centurion, is worthy for whom he should do this. And why did the Jews have such a degree of fondness for this centurion, when typically that wasn't the case? They said, for he loveth our nation, and he had built us a synagogue. So the centurion had a special place in his heart for the, for the Jews. And he obviously showed and expressed his love for the, for the nation of the Jews. And he even went as far as to build them a synagogue. He obviously was a man of means. <clears throat> but he wasn't just a man of means. We'll find out here that he was also a man of authority. When Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house, so he never really got there, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. The centurion sent friends out to meet Jesus and said to Jesus, Just stop right there. For he said, For I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Now this is a man of, of means, this is a man of some stature, and this is definitely a man of some degree of authority. But say, the, say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. So you say, how did the centurion get this radical idea? Because for most people that wanted people, others to be healed, they, they basically took that person and they brought that person to Jesus so that Jesus could touch them and heal them. They, they believed that they needed to bring an individual into the presence, the physical presence of Jesus, so that Jesus would heal them. Which made, makes all the sense in the world. Except for the centurion. This centurion was accustomed to the role of authority, and this centurion was accustomed to the proper use of authority. And he knew that authority had its place, and he knew that authority had its advantages. Because he himself was a man of authority. He would say unto his soldier, go, and he goeth. He would say unto another, come, and he cometh. He would say unto his servant, do this, and they do it. Without question. 
And why did they do it? Because this centurion had authority. And because of his position of authority, the centurion was able to recognize the authority that was inherent in Jesus Christ. Now remember, the centurion never met Jesus. Even on this occasion, he never met Jesus, never interacted directly with Jesus. The Bible never says he ever did. But he heard about Jesus. And whatever he heard about Jesus led the centurion to believe that Jesus was a man of authority, just like him. And the authority that Jesus possessed, the centurion was going to leverage and take advantage of because he full well understood the benefits of authority. And he knew Jesus had it. Interesting. When you really think about it, it's very interesting. Not just his faith, but where he got his faith. He got his faith because he was accustomed to authority, he recognized authority, and he knew what true authority could do, and he knew that true authority was in the hands of Jesus Christ. Mark, the first chapter. <clears throat> and it says, and in verse 21, Mark 1, 21, um, here is an even more fascinating um, story about authority not just about authority but about let's say the lack of authority at the same time it says and they went into Capernaum and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught and they were astonished at his doctrine for he taught them as one that had authority Jesus did and not as the scribes so this is a really interesting verse just to come out of the gate right here 22 Jesus taught them as one that had authority. Now remember what Jesus is doing here. He's just teaching. He's teaching as other people have also taught in this synagogue. There were other people who were accustomed to teaching in this synagogue. And one of them was the scribes. And there was something that the people there recognized. And noticed. And that was that when Jesus taught them, he taught them as one having authority. Now the interesting thing about this is that the scribes would read the same things that Jesus read. The scribes would read the same passages of scriptures that Jesus read. There was nothing really different about what it was that the scribes read were reading compared to what Jesus was reading. But when Jesus did it, when Jesus taught them out of the scripture, the people recognized this man has authority. Isn't that interesting? I find it fascinating, actually. And they said, he has the kind of authority, uh, he, he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. For some reason, the scribes did not have authority as far as the people were concerned. Or at least they did not, did not have the kind of authority that Jesus Christ seemed to possess, which is very interesting because they're reading out of the same passages, people. And see, this is where I believe that, that defining authority is not that simple. It's actually um, a little difficult sometimes. What is it that Jesus had that the scribes did not have? Um, the people called it authority. That's what they refer to it. They, that he had authority. And if you ask them to describe it, they might have had difficulty describing it, but they knew that it was there. And they recognized it. They may not have been able to give you the definition of it, but when they saw Jesus teach, they recognized it. And they said, and he teaches them with authority, not as the scribes. So let's come to, over to the scribes. The scribes who read out of the same passages, taught out of the same passages, apparently did not have authority. They had a title, but they did not have authority. And this brings me to, to an interesting point. There are many people that have titles. 
titles that seem to grant unto them some degree of authority, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they truly have authority. The scribes, by virtue of their title, the scribes, by virtue of their position, you would have thought would have had authority. But the people recognized that Jesus had authority and the scribes did not. And so they said, he teaches them as one that has authority and not like the scribes. The scribes had a title, but they did not have authority. Having title does not necessarily mean you have authority. Isn't that the truth? Isn't that interesting? And then it goes on when it becomes more fascinating. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, meaning the unclean spirit, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with, with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee, who thou art the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commanded he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. Now I could spend the whole night talking about even this one. But I'll spare you. All right. There was a man with an unclean spirit in the synagogue. And the Bible says the unclean spirit cried out, Let us alone. What have we, what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? So what's interesting about this next verse is the spirit. Think about this now. The spirit recognized the authority of Jesus Christ. In other words, the Spirit recognized the virtue, the intangible virtue of authority when it entered the synagogue. Even more interesting is this. I want to take this a little bit further. It was in all likelihood that this individual with the unclean spirit who who was sitting in the synagogue, that this probably wasn't his first time in the synagogue. This may have been an individual that had been in the synagogue before. This may have even been, been, been an individual that frequented the synagogue. Think about this. So a man with an unclean spirit frequented the synagogue and he sat there. It is like, a, it is like an unclean spirit sitting Let's say, for example, in church. He was sitting in the synagogue where the scriptures were being read. He was sitting in the synagogue where the doctrines were being taught. But the interesting thing about this unclean spirit that was in this man was that the unclean spirit sat there and was never intimidated, was never frightened, was never threatened, and was never challenged until true authority walked into the synagogue. <clears throat> yes, there were scribes in the synagogue. Yes, there were Pharisees in the synagogue. But there was no authority. You see, the synagogue had men with titles, but not men with authority, or at least not the kind of authority that even challenged an unclean spirit. They were men with titles, but no authority. And even the people with titles, if you read in the book of Mark, just a little um, footnote here, book of Mark, the 11th chapter, 27 and 28, it says, and they came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, they come to him, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. All right, here are the chief priests, men with titles. The scribes, men with titles. And the elders, men with titles. These were men with prominence. These were men with titles. But these were men that may not necessarily have had authority. And they were very curious about the authority that Jesus possessed. 
And they said unto him, By what authority doest thou these things? You see, even the men with titles recognize authority. Even the men with titles recognize that Jesus had a special kind of authority. And they said, And who gave thee this authority to do these things? So the chief priests, the scribes, the elders, the men with titles, but no authority, the men with titles recognized that Jesus had authority, and so they said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority to do these things? Even the men with titles could see Jesus possessed authority. <clears throat> so let's bring this home. But what about us? What about you and I? The authority of the believer. What about us? We all know that Jesus would have had authority. He's the Son of God. He would have had great authority. But what about us? See, I'm the oldest among three boys. And when we were growing up, there was, you know, there was the rare occasion that my parents um, had to go somewhere for a very short period of time. And when they did that, <clears throat> when we were younger, when they did that, they transferred... <laughs> authority over to me because I was the oldest of three brothers. I was, I was the one that was supposed to be re more responsible, uh -huh. supposedly more responsible. And so when my parents de decided that they need to leave, but they would be back uh, in a short moment, the authority was passed over to me. They would look at me and they would say, take care of your brothers. We now basically give you the authority in this household until we get back and it is your responsibility to take care of your brothers and so i did my best i determined what we would have for dinner where i determined what channel on the television we would watch so much for authority and every now and then um, my brothers would sort of challenged my authority because they didn't like what I was what I was doing and you know every now and then I may have had to subdue that authority but as soon as my parents came back um, the authority was given back unto them but for for a fleeting moment there I was responsible for everything in the household and I was responsible for taking care of my two brothers and I was res I was given authority to do certain things which I normally would not have the authority to do. And there's a similar passage in Scripture that sort of alludes to that and alludes to the authority of the believer. And believe me, people, we need this authority today. That's why I'm touching this subject. We need this authority today badly. And so Luke 9 chapter, Luke chapter 9, <clears throat> then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power. I'll read that one more time. Then he called his 12 disciples, the followers of Jesus, together and gave them power and authority. What, was, what, what were they doing before this? I'm not quite sure. But suddenly, in Luke chapter 9, Jesus gave them power and authority over what? Over all devils. Isn't that amazing? And to cure diseases. So the very things that Jesus was doing. Casting out of devils and healing the sick. The very things that Jesus was doing. The very things that the men with titles was asking Jesus. Who gave you this kind of authority? Who? Why do you have this authority? Those very things. That kind of authority was given. Transferred is not the proper word here. It was, it was given unto the disciples and the followers, followers of Jesus Christ. Now that gets heavy, but that's important for you and I. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick, the very same things that Jesus was doing. And he said unto them, Take nothing for your journey, neither staves nor scrip, neither bread, neither money, neither have two coats apiece. And whatsoever house ye enter in, there abide and thence depart. And whosoever will not receive you when ye go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet for a testimony against them. And the disciples departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. 
And how and why is it they could do this suddenly? Why is it they could preach the gospel? Doesn't indicate that they were preaching the gospel ever before. But suddenly they were preaching the gospel and suddenly they were healing everywhere and suddenly they were casting out demons. Why did this happen? How did this happen? It is because of the first verse. Jesus gave them power and authority. Handed it to them. And said, the very kind of power and authority that you see me demonstrating, I hand over to you. Now you go out and you demonstrate it. Hallelujah. <laughs> now I'm getting excited. And so apparently, the power and the authority that Jesus Christ had was, was able to be given. Able to be transferred over to his followers, to his disciples. And the disciples, when they came back, they were excited about this. They, they came back to Jesus and they said, said, we're able to heal the sick. We're able to preach the gospel. We're able to cast out demons. They were excited with their newfound authority. They were just excited for good reason. And Jesus said to them in, in, in Luke the 10th chapter, Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and power to tread on scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall be by any means hurt you. Listen to this one more time. I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. That is an important statement. Christ gave his, his followers power and authority over all the powers of the enemy. And then he went on to say, notwithstanding in this rejoice, not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Even something to be more ecstatic about. Why is this verse important? Why am I even getting excited? <laughs> I don't know. Because I believe we're living in a time when, when darkness, and all of you understand what I'm saying, we're living in a time when darkness believes that it has us cornered. It has us where it wants us. It even has the church or the people of God where it wants it. They believe they have the authority over us. And that they're blasphemous and anti-Christ agenda can now be promoted and executed. But not so fast. For the saints of God, the people of God are still here. We haven't been raptured yet. We're still here. And according to all scriptures that I just read right there, I give unto you power over all the power of the enemy. God gives us authority over all the power of the enemy. If we really believe this, it is time for we, the saints, to take back our authority. Take back our authority by prevailing before the throne of God. That's how we get our authority back. Right now, it looks like the wicked have the authority. Right now, it looks like all these people with titles, with great and grandoise titles, have the authority. But no, the wicked do not have the authority. God. The Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it unto whomsoever he will. God still has the authority, and God, according to Scripture, New Testament Scripture, wants to give that authority unto his followers, and unto his people, and unto his saints. For it is the saints of God, the people of God, who are still here in this world. And it is time for us to take back our authority by prevailing before the throne of God. And maybe in some ways we, the church, have surrendered our authority. Maybe we've, you know, just, just haven't noticed. But now we notice. Every, it, we notice. We see what's going on. The wicked, even those in high positions um, and, and, and high titles, you can see that, that they're, using those positions and using those titles to defy God. 
to defy the things of God and to do some of the most heinous things imaginable. That is why the innocent um, die in the womb every single year by the, by the tens of thousands. And it is time for the saints of God, it is time for the people of God to say no more, we take back our authority. Our authority over this nation, our authority over this world. It is the people of God who have the real authority over this nation and this world unless the people of God decide to concede it to the wicked, which we must not. Let us not concede our authority over to the wicked. It is time to take back our authority, saints. It is time to take back our authority. Yes, we will. Yes, we must. We always say, God is in control. And I'm okay with that. But I think it is even better than that. God is not just in control. God is on the move. If we prevail in prayer before the throne of God in this day and age that we are living in, God is on the move. The lion of the tribe of Judah, back to the lion, the one with the roar, the one with authority, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Remember, he is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And the lion can be on the move again. And I still believe, more than ever actually, that the lion of the tribe of Judah is ready to do great things through the Spirit and through his people. And we, the people of God, must come back and claim our rightful authority, our rightful authority in this world, which is given to us by Jesus Christ. Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? Do you not know that we shall even judge angels? How much more the things that pertain to this life? God, help us to take back our authority. Let's pray. The Heavenly Father, Lord, we are grateful for your word, your powerful word. We are grateful for the authority that you give unto your believers, unto your followers, Lord. And maybe we have been neglectful in, in not claiming that authority, Lord, but in this day, in this world that we live in, when we see the darkness that is hovering all around us and all about us, we know, we recognize it is time to take back our authority in this world. This world was not created by our enemy. And this world nor this nation belongs to the enemy. It belongs to God. And the Lord God can give us, the people of God, the rightful authority over this nation and over this world. Lord, we just need to come to the throne and take it back. Ask for it back. That we, that we, Lord, may be able to be the light to this world once again and the salt to this earth once again. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.